Is that gonna help? Is it a link? Is it a link to my website? It's not the hyperlink. <laughs> on the, so if I click on it, what do you do then? Click. Can you see it? There we go. Cool. You want to move this forward? Do I look nice in the camera? <laughs> yeah, do you look good? Does my shirt look wrinkled? Can you see? Oh, yeah, you can look on there. <laughs> you don't need to see. Look at what we left right now. Yeah. It will help. Just relax. Look at the all the way back there. Doesn't matter. You just look in the direction. I don't know why. There. No, I'm normally fine with giving talks. And Julian's there. Uh, you can look to Julian. Julian always in a good position. If you look at him, he always looks no. <laughs> so he will give you like this confidence. Okay, good. Thanks. Hello. <laughs> yeah, and there is your name somewhere there, so... Yeah, your name's on this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Michael Cerny's actually... It's a mystery how this happened. No. <laughs> so, is this, is this on? so, everyone, we're going to um, get started with our next session. My name is... Gina Grassi, and I'll be the session chair for this session. Uh, the first paper will be presented by two authors, um, Ahmed Khalifa and Michael Green, and they'll be presenting um, general video game rule generation. Okay, so I'm Ahmed Khalifa, and this is Michael Green, and we're going to present our paper, which is the general video game rule generation. So why we want to generate rules? Imagine you are a game developer, and you are really bored, and you don't have any ideas to do. So you can just ask the computer, give me a new idea, and it just produce a prototype, and then you play it and say, oh, it's good, maybe I could develop it in a bigger game. Also, like generating rules in general in order to make the computer get good rules, you need to understand what's mean by a good game. So just researching in this topic will make you understand more about game design, about games. Also, it could be used as a like an AI challenge because it's very hard to like make the computer get a good game where human can say, yeah, this is a good game, not a shit one. So in order to generate the games, we need some way to describe these games. And we use the video game description language as a language where you can describe different types of games so the computer can search the space and find new games. And just for simplicity, I just put the key parts of the video game description language, which is the sprite set, which is uh, all the game objects in the game, such as you have an avatar. In this game, you have an avatar, you have spider, you have wall, you have key, and there is a door. Also, there is another section for interaction rules, and these rules are just collision rules. What will happen if two objects collide? For example, if the spider collides with the avatar, the avatar will die. And the third one is the termination conditions, which says how the game should end. And it, it's something like if the avatar dies, game lose, or if like the avatar reaches the door, you win. And the last thing is the level itself. So there is a way if to represent the level as a two-dimensional matrix. But, and in the end, it will generate a level look like that, based on the other information in the VGDL. So, we want to make the rule generation, like the challenge, is a little bit easier because it's very hard to generate everything, even the level and, and the sprites and all these objects. So we decided to fix the sprite set and the current level and ask the user to generate only the interaction rules and termination conditions. And still, just to generate interaction rules and termination conditions, it's still a very hard challenge to like solve. So our rule generator get from the system 
all this uh, like all the sprite sets and the current level, and it's also to get a forward model where you can simulate your current game, and you have to return back the generated interaction rules and transmission condition at the end. So with the framework, we generate like did like three sample generators with the framework just to make people like in, uh, like understand what's happening. And down there, it's just a generated rule by the first generator, which is the random generator. And the random generator from the name, it just generates random games. That works. So what it do is just pick two different object sprites we have, and then pick a random collision rule, and then say that's a collision rule, and put it there. And for the termination condition, it generates one for losing and one for winning. The one for losing is always fixed. If the avatar dies, you, like, you lose the game. While the winning, uh, it could be anything. If timer timed out, the game timed out, or it could just any certain object dies, uh, and that's it. And as you can see, the game down there is broken, like because most of the like this game, most of the collisions that there is between objects that never collide, which might be the avatar itself because he's down on the screen, and maybe one of the bases which is above him, so he never can collide with them. So most of the games where the random is kind of broken. The second one, we try just to use some knowledge base to improve our games, like some ideas and some stuff we know about GVGI itself. And we made the constructive generator where we designed this template and we try to fit all different objects in this template and get a game out of it. So what it do, it first categorize different sprites into like uh, buckets like there is like avatars, there is stuff that you can collect, there is NBCs, there is stuff that move like the boulders there that's moving up and down, they are movable. They are, you have the diamonds, they are like collectible resource you can collect. And you have the avatar, you have like the door, which is the exit one. After you do that, it put interactions that make sense for each of the category. For example, if you have an NBC is trying to chase the player, it's probably tried to kill him. So by default, there is a high chance this sprite, when it collides with the player, it will kill him. It will never give him a score. Like, uh, unless it's a suicidal like, guy, he's just going there to give you a score and kill himself. So it does this like, for all the different categories. And then it generates termination conditions, which is kind of similar to the random one. It always loses when the player dies. And you could win. If one of the objects that get destroyed in the game from the interaction reach zero, like well, as you can see, the player down there can collect the boulders that are going up and down and get score out of them. So the winning condition could be if the number of these boulders reach zero because they can be destroyed. And Mike will continue from here. So uh, I did the search-based generator. Um, we decided to make this with a FI 2POP genetic algorithm. And the reason why we decided to do that is because in the competition, there's a time limit. So in order to more effectively evolve, we decided to split the population into two subpopulations. FI 2POP stands for feasible and infeasible. So essentially, one of the populations is infeasible. These games are completely broken. Uh, their goal is to try to get into the feasible population <laughs> And the goal of the feasible population is to have the highest fitness in classic uh, evolutionary style. So uh, feasibility was decided using this uh, constraint function where games that were infeasible had errors that would crash the GVJAI engine. Um, often, more often than not, they would cause death in the player in the first like 40 frames of the game, which is typically one second, and the, you can't play a game like that. Uh, and then this thing that we called bad frames. Bad frames are defined as frames within the game where sprites are drawn outside the boundaries that you can see. Obviously, these games wouldn't be very feasible to play because you wouldn't be able to see what was going on outside the bounds of the game. So we wouldn't really want to play those. And then fitness was decided upon uh, Nielsen's research in uh, algorithm. I forget the name. Yeah, relative algorithm performance. Uh, so essentially, a really smart agent and a not-so-smart agent would play the same game, and the smart agent should score better and win more often than the dumb agent would uh, in a good game. Sorry. Uh, and then the unique rules, uh, we wanted as many rules in the act interaction set to be activated as possible inside of a good game. So that was definitely a factor. And then in game length, we decided that longer games, games that would be 500 frames or longer, which is about 10 to 12 seconds, 
would be more interesting than games that would last, you know, maybe like five seconds or something like that. So that was considered high, uh, sorry, high fitness. This uh, graph shows similarity of games between all three of the generators. Um, so basically here on the x-axis we have similarity, which is normalized between zero and one, where zero are games that are very, very similar to each other, almost identical, and one would be games that are nothing alike. Uh, and then we have it by population density. Um, this is, the similarity is measured by comparing all of the interaction rules inside of a game with all the other interaction rules of all the other games within a same generator's population, so all the random games are compared to all the other random games, and then picking the most similar game to it. Uh, and so you see here we have the constructive generator has a very high density, particularly around the zero and 0 0.1, uh, excuse me, 0 0.1 area. Uh, this is because constructive is built on template, so basically you have a template kind of game and you don't really differentiate very far from that. Uh, the random has a very particular curve. We're not exactly quite sure why that is, but we have a feeling that it has something to do with the fact that we constrained random to having between two and five rules. Um, so maybe some of those rules are more similar than others. And then you can see that the genetic kind of makes everything. So it has some games that are very similar to each other, and then it has a few that are all the way over closer to the 1.0, which are games that have nothing to do with anything else, um, which is, of course, due to the mutation and crossover part of, of genetic algorithms. We also did a user study. Um, this user study was collected using 161 comparisons. We would give users two different games to play, and then they would compare those games and decide either if game A was better than game B, or if uh, game B was better than game A, or if both games were just trash, or if both of them were good. Uh, we decided to throw away um, all the answers that had to do with both of them being bad or both of them being good because we found <laughs> that they weren't statistically significant. And then, so that's why you see some of the denominators don't add up to 161. Um, and we found, we hypothesized that the search-based generator should have better games than the constructive, and the constructive generator should have better games than the random. And for the most part, we found this to be true, uh, except for in the Aliens game, which was very particular. Uh, we had three different games for Aliens, and three, uh, for their search, and for the constructive and the random, and then three different games for Boulder Dash, and three different games for Solar Fox, for each generator. And out of the search-based uh, generator alien games, two of them have this rule down here, which we highlighted in red. If avatar collides with background, then undo everything, which essentially what that is is the avatar is always colliding with the background, and undo everything literally does that. It just goes back to how it was before. So this would freeze the game for the entirety of the game. So users would just see this standstill aliens game that nothing happened. and we we hypothesized that that happened because the generator thought that would solve its bad frames issue where objects were traveling outside of the frame. So it was like, well, if nothing can move, uh, nothing can go outside the bounds of the frame. And it's not wrong. So that's definitely a fix that we want to try to get in the future, which brings us to our future work, which is to generate better games. Uh, ultimately, the user study showed us that none of the games were particularly fun to play of any of the generators. So there's obviously some work that we need to do there. We want to run the competition, which Ahmed was talking about yesterday. Um, and we want to evolve full games with all four of the different parts of interactions, sprites, levels, um, and stuff like that. So, and that's all that we have. So, time for questions. <laughs> okay. Hey, thank you. Uh, if you ever find out the way to code uh, fun, how to detect fun in a game, you just give me a call, okay? <laughs> and uh, if it's possible. And uh, kind of, uh, maybe I lost it because I'm sorry, I just uh, entered a few minutes later. Uh, what kind of evolutionary system are you using? Are you using grammars for this or something like that? Grammatical evolution or just to play any version? No, right? no. so what we do is we take the interaction, sorry, can you everyone hear me? We take the interaction and the termination sets, and we do simple one-point crossover and then mutation on top of those. Okay. So it's, it's really, really simple. And uh, since I've been also using the E5 <coughs> two population, the feasible and feasible two population genetic algorithm for other stuff, uh, we, in our study, we uh, discovered eventually that the 
number of individuals that were moving from the infeasible population to the feasible population was super low, and that was unexpected. In your case, <coughs> was like that, or? I don't was it? remember that, but there was like, since the population started at the beginning <laughs> by using the constructive generator, like the initial population, like 40% is random, and 20% from the constructive generator, and there is, uh, 40, another 40% 40 mutated version of the constructive. So you can ha you start at the beginning with some stuff in the feasible population and some stuff that near feasibility. So there is, at the beginning, a lot of, I think there was a lot of stuff go to the feasible, but the problem is they go back and forth between yeah. them. So yeah. Yeah, from I, the feasible to the infeasible, that happens frequently. The, yeah. other, the problem is the I, other way I can't really say that we measured necessarily between infeasible to feasible like all the time, but uh, like what he we, said, we it started off. That, yeah, we no. yeah, but we it started off. There was quite a bit in the feasible population already because of how we initialized the population. Okay, good. Thank you. So I like the future work bit about generate games, which are actually fun. Um, I mean, where do you where do you think the uh, biggest weakness is in the current system? So, what was is it to do with the generation, or is it to do with how you evaluate the fitness? Yeah, it's uh, it's the fitness. Itself. I would I would say definitely the fitness. Okay. Yeah, that's definitely. So the one of the things that the bad frames is kind of <coughs> a little bit sometimes stupid uh, because the system, like let's say it's a our bad frame says if any game have more than 30% of its frames, objects are outside, the game is broken. And so you can say if you have the alien games and you have one bullet, but the bullet doesn't have like a collision with the top, and this bullet just go outside of the screen, you will have like 90% of the time like uh, the game is broken, although all the other stuff is supposed to be working well. So there is like what's called spikes in the fitness, yeah. which is not a good thing. Have you tried running your fitness function on the existing set of GVG AI games? We didn't do that, but we run it on the constructive generated, like the ones that run for, came from the constructive, and they have high fitness in general. But we didn't try on like the VGL, like the original ones. It, it'd, be, try, yeah. it'd be really worth doing that. And yeah, also, I think, I think so, of, yeah. the, of the current games that are already there, some are actually quite good fun to play, and some are really not. Yeah. So things like, you know, camel race. Camel race is not. Is not. <laughs> wait for breakfast is worse. So. Okay, okay. You just have to wait doing nothing for and like five seconds. And you yeah. Win. That's it. <laughs> so it, it'd be really interesting to uh, just yeah. run, run that measure across the entire set of VGDL games <laughs> that are there already. Yeah. And just just see if it correlates with how much fun you think they are. Right? Yeah, I think we need a user study on GVGI yeah. games. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, all right, everyone go online. No. <laughs> but but uh, I think um, having this sort of really uh, large set of statistics for yeah. human testing is great. But actually, you can trust your own intuition as well. Yeah. So, you know, you already know that yeah. wait for breakfast and camera race are really not fun. Yeah. And that, that's and some of the games are a bit of fun. And j just, just see intuitively, is it? Yeah. Is it kind of making sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. We do have time for other questions, so please come up. Yeah, we have a lot of time. Yeah, we have, we have a lot of time. <laughs> Short presentation. First of all, thanks for the, you know, this um, PCG for GPG AI because it's fun stuff and it's encouraging. Uh, my question is, uh, do you have some ideas how to generalize the uh, these games without, you know, if then else in everything. Like you said, you have some kind of a constraint goal rules, like always uh, the avatar uh, dies to, to the loose, okay. and yeah, it's kind of like that. So there can be multiple, multiple such tasks, but you know, we don't have to make gener the generator like if that, then that, and so on. So, so do you have any idea how to? You know, so the search is supposed to be like that, like there is no if something inside it, it's just supposed to find something that perform well with the agents playing. But uh, you start with 
mainly, I'm sorry, but you mainly start with this uh, rule base. I mean, the, but the, it's twenty percent, like, and you have forty percent random, so and still you have the rest 20%. of the population is is using the the search base generators mutating function, which is basically just it scrambles everything. So the you know there's a forty percent, twenty percent, forty percent. It mm. either like remove one of the rules or add a new random, totally random one, like with uh, all the permutations it have, or it changes one of the parameters in any of the existing rules to any value that's feasible for it so yeah so simply going more deep into the uh, generator uh, yeah yeah the mu that uh, that mutation is part of the reason why you see this giant spread on similarity because some of the games are going to be really really similar to each other and part of that's because of the constructive uh, games that already had a pretty good fitness to begin with and kind of stuck with the generator through time or a lot of their rules did and then some of the way over there in like near the point eight that's just because it just mutated into something else that's not related to anything else in the population. Right. Any other questions? Okay, so let's please thank our speakers for today's presentation. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Um, he looks familiar. He was here in the last session. Um, his paper or by Lewis Horsley and Diego Perez entitled Building an Automatic Spray Generator with Deep Convolutional Generative Adversarial Networks. So. Thank you. OK, this actually will be short as well. Um, it's, it's a nice story about this paper. Essentially, uh, Lewis Horsley is one of the uh, undergrad students at the University of Essex. Uh, this, this is his final uh, third year project. Uh, so this is even before master's level. Um, and the idea is, well, uh, he said to, to this project and we saw, well, maybe this is quality enough to be sent to somebody that knows about this stuff to get some feedback. Um, there are some people like that here and apparently it got accepted. So it's, it's kind of a, a very nice thing. Um, and the idea is, is, well, exactly what it says there. It's trying to build an automatic sprite generator. Um, so I'm basically going to give the main objectives and, and the motivation behind why we uh, propose this as a project. Um, and then we're going to see exactly how, 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 we, or how has he built the, the generator, because this is 99% um, his work. Um, and what kind of um, sprays have we been able to generate and, um, and some conclusions and, and future work. So, so the main objective is to provide some kind of uh, evidence or our first, our first experimentation to see how it's possible to create or to use uh, deep learning of deep convolutional uh, neural networks or with GANs um, for creating sprite generation. So create new new sprites out of, uh, out of some existing sets. Um, the, the idea is to create sprites that are actually small. So we're talking about 25 by 25 um, pixels, uh, you might recognize these kind of sprites from the GBGAI game, so everything is related. Um, uh, and the idea is to, is, is to have this system, it's able to create automatically new sprites um, out of a set of sprites that we have as input. Um, and I'll, I'll explain a bit more a bit, uh, about this later, but the idea is that to ease the production of uh, sprites, that why this would be interesting uh, for small uh, or indie game companies. So in case you have seen, or you haven't seen what a generative adversarial network is, or GAN, uh, this is kind of the base of, of, the, of the methodology here. Uh, it's, it's, a it's a composition of two different neural networks. Uh, one of them is the generative one, the other one is the, dis discrimi the discrimin yeah, discriminative, the D, the G and the D. Um, and basically there are two networks working uh, against each other. Uh, typically there are two uh, multi-layer perceptrons, uh, and D, or the discriminator, tries to distinguish um, samples from the model distributions, while the generator tries to create samples that belong uh, or seem to belong to this distribution. In a way, it's like uh, it's, it's typical set that uh, this is a kind of counterfeit against police mode, while you have a set of sprites that belong to the input data that you want, uh, and, and then you have one of the agents, which is the G, this uh, generator, tries to create from scratch, uh, 
an image that could be part of that set. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be strange to be part of the set. Um, and while it tries to create this kind of fake image that doesn't belong to the set, the other one, the discriminator or the police, tries to identify that as one that is not part of the, set, the original set. So essentially, that creates a, con a competition between these two networks. One that tries to create a new sample for the that follows a model, and the other one tries to identify that one as not uh, part of the set. And the competition between the two is what actually gives these uh, guns the adversarial part, and, and it creates uh, creates uh, some evolution of uh, of sprites being generated. Um, so. Well, essentially, for the sprites, this is this is the way it works. Uh, the, the good thing about guns, well, guns can come used for multiple things, um, and the the idea here is to is to just take uh, this gun idea and include it with convolutional neural networks uh, using the capabilities that uh, convolutions and treating images as is done in deep learning, uh, and it has been so successful in the last years. Uh, include this capability into the in, into this methodology of two different networks fighting each other. Uh, which gives you the name of deep convolutional generative adversarial networks or DC guns. Um, there are some specific. These are um, described in the paper. There's essentially the different things that have been done in, in the in the networks uh, by just trying and error adapting different um, modifications that uh, can be found in the in the literature. For instance, using um, studied convolution instead of um, instead of max booling. Uh, trying to modify how the discriminator downsamples the the data that it receives and how the generator has to create sprites or create an, an image um, tries to uh, help how, how this up sampling is done. Um, it uses uh, global average pooling. That essentially means that the, the latest the latest layers are not fully connected. So instead of that, uh, they they try to there, there are some of the of the conditions that are not present uh, in order to um, improve the stability and the, and avoid overfitting, which is one of the problems that um, that Louis uh, found in his his uh, study. Uh, another thing that are more normal, like batch normalization, all the input is normalized with, with a mean zero and variance of one. And uh, instead of using uh, ReLUs or uh, rectifier uh, linear units, uh, is, is using leaky ReLUs, which essentially what it does is since, uh, for, for the, in the moment when the neuron, the neuron is not active, instead of giving a value of zero as an output, gives you a small value, a small negative value. And in general, this, using these specifics in, in the networks uh, helped um, obtaining better, better results. So if we, if we want to analyze both, both networks, one of them is the generator. Uh, the, the generator is, is built with four deconvolutional layers. <coughs> Sorry. The first one is um, essentially um, the input, which is uh, an n-dimensional vector. So this is basically, uh, you can see a zeros and ones, basically a random vector. And that goes through four different decumul decumulation layers. This, this is the opposite of what's typically seen in image analysis. You have uh, some um, input, and that input generates an image. So if you just put inside here um, a random vector of zeros and ones, what you get in the end is basically noise. Um, this has been done with uh, TensorFlow, so I just put this in the in the slides in case you, you want to check it. But in general, this is the, the code that generates these uh, these different convolutions or deconvolutions. Uh, so this will be the one that tries to generate images. That's why it ends up with an image over here. The discriminator, what it does is the opposite thing. It just takes an image and uses convolutional layers in this case and tries to end up with, in this case, one uh, value, which is essentially a probability value. Um, and this probability value is this value between zero and one. Essentially, it tells you how how probable is that this image belongs to one or the other set. So if it belongs to the set that, that you're trying to uh, discriminate against. <coughs> okay. Um, when we put these two um, networks together, the way it works is you have this generator here that basically takes something here and generates uh, generates an image, and uh, you have a set of training data. Uh, and then sample one element from this training data, and both images are, are thrown thrown through the discriminator, and this comes with two different values, p of a and p of v. p of a would be the probability that this new generated image belongs to the set, and this guy is trying to maximize that probability, uh, while p of v uh, is trying is is still checking that this one. So well, let, let's say this the, the discriminator tries to minimize p of a, so 
basically find out if this one is not part of the of the training set, and it still has to maximize uh, the fact that the training data belongs to the training data. Because one thing that the, the discriminator could do is just saying everything doesn't belong to the to a training set, and that's definitely something that would work to uh, basically destroy the generator. But you still need to be able to recognize the uh, the sprites that are part of the input. Um, so coming to the experimental work, we essentially have uh, three different data sets, and they they all of them uh, tackle a, a specific problem that uh, can be found when when trying to work with it. <coughs> one of them, the first one, is human-like characters. Uh, human-like characters, uh, they are they are all, um, I can't remember exactly how many, but there are more than 200, 300 different sprites, uh, and all of them, uh, they look quite similar. They, they look like, well, you have to, uh, like a human. You have two legs, two arms, something that seems like a head. Uh, sometimes you have something in your hands. Um, it's kind of the perfect scenario when you have many, many, um, sprites that look very nice to each other, and then you want to say, well, let's just create something that is that could be one uh, in image inside that that set. Faces, um, faces tries to tackle another problem, which is the fact that we have very little samples. So in this case, this is a, um, a set with only 32 samples, um, and they are slightly different. They are not as similar as this one, uh, but um, it's also a, a first plane of the of the actual actual face. So. Even if uh, if they are different, the main problem here is that uh, we don't have many many faces. And then the creatures, which is the probably the is, is quite extensive. But it's probably even more extensive than than human like character. We have lots of data here, but they are completely different. We have uh, some kind of a knight, some kind of spaghetti monster, and some kind of uh, a bat or Pac-Man something. Um, so the idea is we have many many different sprites, and they they, they belong to completely different categories. Um, as I said, the, the training was done with TensorFlow and using also CUDA, and, and depending on the sets, uh, it was it was a very fast evolution because we don't have that many data. Um, so if we, we take a look at the results, essentially for the human-like characters, um, these are results that actually are are, are, bastante, are very good in general. They are they are you have different. Um, Different evolutions, different iterations uh, for each for each uh, one of the experiments run, uh, and in some cases you can see how some of the sprites are actually genuinely new. So this is this is one case where these two are part of the input, and this one is one of the sprites generated. So and you can see so kind of morphing between the two. It's like you take this kind of soldier uh, with this fireman, and then it, be, it creates something which is more or less uh, in between. It's not perfect; it has some noise, but uh, it's better than the rest that's coming next. So. Yeah. <laughs> so let's let's be optimistic about this slide. Uh, the next one faces uh, it creates something which is not as good. I mean, this is another couple of examples. These are part of the the input, and this is part of the output. And and this is a problem where well, essentially, what you have is basically combination of of a few different uh, sprites, uh, and then the output is well something that looks very similar to that, but with more noise. Uh, so very noisy results in this case. But even more noisy is when you have creatures, when you have different kind of blobs. And what you get is essentially um, small blobs of figures that uh, you can try to identify because you're a human. And you can try, maybe this is a brain, or maybe something different. Um, what we like to say is, well, if, if the PCG like uh, generator cannot create something that you can work with, it can be inspiration for a designer. Uh, well, we want to get better than that. But at the moment, with that variety of, of sprites, basically what we get is mostly noise. Uh, and there are valid reasons for that. Um, so essentially, this, as I said, this is a, a very initial work. Basically, the idea is what, what happens if we just have all these images, we try to put them through, through a DC gun and see, see what we get. And in some cases, these results could be decent and acceptable. Um, but basically, what we are showcasing here is this, this two different problems. The sparsity of the data, we don't have enough data, uh, and the diversity of the data. And, but at least for me, this is why this is interesting, because when you have a diversity of data or a specialty of data, you have a, have a company that cannot afford maybe uh, either um, buying new sprites or paying somebody that creates sprites for you. You basically can have this system that has the sprite that you have and create new data. Imagine you have, uh, you want to create a, a game of an army where you have lots of uh, different soldiers, and you want all soldiers to be different, because that's how actually things are. Um, and maybe you have th five or six different soldiers, and from that you can create maybe potentially infinite amount of soldiers with different faces, different um, colors, different 
um, color of the of the hair, whatever. Um, and that's that's the actual situation. If you have a if if that uh, person that wants to create sprites have already one thousand sprites, well then it doesn't need to create new sprites. So that's that's the problem that we're trying to tackle here. Um, and that's why I think this is this is a, a relevant problem for somebody to, to investigate and continue with this uh, future work as well, um, because it's um, it could be a, a very nice uh, resource for for these kind of uh, problems. Um, and then as as future work, um, explore the types of networks, explore the configurations that could be useful. Uh, we have used DC guns. There might be a reason not to use DC guns. Uh, could be DC guns bring you the the, um, the good um, features of uh, convolutions, uh, but maybe a combination of guns could also work, uh, especially thinking around that the data that we have is very small, uh, so it's possible to use that as well. Um, and, and of course, this is sprites, but could be applied to, to some other things, could be applied to uh, three-dimensional assets, for instance. You can have uh, I don't know, a collection of vessels, and, and the vessels are completely created up, up starting with five or, or six different models, and then you have uh, a, a complete generation of, um, of infinite, potentially infinite vessels. Um, and then another point that is actually quite important is the, the need to include novelty. If you have five or six elements as the input data, uh, the system at the moment what it can do is basically merge what it has, but without including any new things. And there is a lot of research in, uh, in novelty search or in actually creativity or uh, computational creativity that could also feed into this and add more, um, more details or more variation to the space that you can generate. And that's actually it. I'm going to do a similar question to when I did uh, yesterday. Uh, have you thought about incorporating a higher level um, uh, design uh, considerations which enter into the design of uh, sprites? So for instance, there's uh, curves of action, movement, uh, the, the, because a designer when he designs a, a character, mm. it is, it's not just thinking about the, the pixels and the convolution mm. the pixels. He's thinking about the certain high-level aspects of the um, of the character, the eyes. Mm. The, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, so tr form. trying to identify different features. The features, mm -hmm. high-level features, and, and he tries then to mm. incorporate in the character. Have you thought about uh, generating at, like that? At from what, the high-level features. It's uh, not exactly like that, but we have. We tried, or he tried at the beginning something different, which was trying to say, if, if you are creating soldiers, for instance, then you have uh, weapons, you have a helmet, you have different trousers. So instead of just evolu uh, creating new sprites entirely, just create different parts of them. So let's say you have maybe the weapons, there are three or five different types of weapons. How can you create new type of weapons? And then somehow match them together and create a new sprite with that. Uh, but the problem that we had, again, was finding the sprites for that. So finding the input data for for all these uh, networks that was the that was the main problem, uh, and with the the issue with this uh, particular set, the human-like characters, is that there were enough sprites in that set to be able to generate something. Uh, before that, he, he, you, I don't know, we, we tried with bicycles as well, and if you look for a bicycle in in sprite-like bicycles in Google, you, you find one or two. So yeah, yeah it's it's complicated. <coughs> Can you go back to the one but last slide? Um, one more till the end. Yeah, mm -hmm. this one. Um, it's in, in the line of, of the, the question of Pedro, um, there are features in in the input, like say in the second one you have one color filling the the, the whole mm. the whole sprite. In the first one you have a very clear one color contour. Yeah. Would it be possible to to extract these features and apply them? One or two of these features in in an output, whatever the form, mm -hmm. the shape, the feeling. I think it would be possible. Uh, I don't know if you could get a completely noise-free image, uh, but uh, it, could, it could be possible. That's really. try, try try to identify different parts of the sprites and, well, and it's basically not, translate. It's them. not localized. It's it's mm. a feature a feature not a, at a high level like mm -hmm. he said. Like uh, this is a weapon. This is a helmet, but it's a it's a graphical feature. There's mm -hmm. a, there's a clear contour. There's a clear part that is totally filled with one single color and. We, I, I really miss this in all the outputs that came out of this. Mm -hmm. 
there's a lot of vagueness, a lot of yeah. no, noise, but a lot of... Uh, yeah, but it's, it's, it's also, I mean, if, it's also noise. You see all these dots over here that for some reason are generated. They, but it, the it, amount of colors in the contour, for example, mm -hmm. is, is, is astonishing. Yeah. It's varying lots of gray and yeah. different colors. Yeah. Uh, it, this is easier, easier to get. Yeah, I, and also easy to, to post-process. To just take this image and, and, and make it, it smoother as well. Yeah, uh, we're just showing the, the raw output of the of the networks. But yeah, that, that would be possible. <coughs> um, well, first, I just had a small question, but why did you guys choose the 25 by 25s? Because the, isn't it usually with DC GAN, like you're doubling each size. Mm -hmm. So I think if you don't, stay on like uh, powers of two then sometimes the strides can don't fit perfectly and you can get weird artifacts i i, I would guess that's basically because that was the, the data that we had and i actually went with that okay uh, anything yeah probably we didn't even care about that yeah. and then uh i wondered uh, have you seen some of the uh like the papers where they use gans on like uh transforming like a light sketch into an image mm -hmm. i don't know if uh, ah, yes 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 sure. uh yeah. then Maybe um, mm. if creating like little sketches for each of mm. those, yeah. maybe that would help with the load data if you just do a transformation instead of creating. At, actually, part, part of the project was uh, doing a background as well, oh, and creating okay. background, background. In, in that in that same uh -huh. way, Cre creating sketches and incorporating texture, but mm. that fell out of the scope of the of the yeah, time yeah, that yeah, it was. Yeah, but yeah. but definitely it's, it's a good idea. Yeah, okay. it's something we looked at. So I also want to just add a short comment. Mm -hmm. um, from a spriters-based view, what those uh, early games often did because of a memory restriction, they just created one sprite and had different color palettes on it. Mm -hmm. So for the neural network, it might be interesting to just distinguish between texture and shape. So that yeah. you really split this into two areas where you have the main sprite and the coloring on, it, on top of it. And then uh -huh. you can combine both parts um, the, bit by bit. Yeah, so no, it's this, a, this might it's help a, in producing. Uh, it would create output. definitely cleaner yeah. output at the end. Yeah, yeah, I believe so. Yeah, that's a good idea. So. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, so let's please thank Diego again. Thank thank and I'd like to invite the next speaker to. Um, Get ready for their work, please. Uh, which would be? So um, today we have Alberto Uriati um, presenting procedural level generation using multi-layer representations with MDMCS. So hello everybody. As you may notice, I'm not one of the authors of the paper, <laughs> but uh, they were unable to come here and ask me to present on behalf of them. So I'm gonna present the procedural level generation using multi-layer level representation with multi-dimensional uh, Markov chains. So what is PCG? If you don't know yet what is PCG, I think this is a wrong conference for you. <laughs> but in any case, it's a creation of content. And if you do this for games, you can create quests like in Skyrim or items or objects uh, <coughs> like in Borderlands or the most typical one, levels uh, like in Diablo or Spelunky. So there have been a lot of different approaches of, uh, like evolutionary algorithms or grammars or fractals. And um, recently there is some approaches with machine learning based techniques that this requires to have a data set for training them and then sample the content with this trained model. So the motivation of this work is, uh, okay, with the machine learning based approach, uh, they focus on the structural information of the maps. So when you create a level with machine learning, uh, there is no meaning of the places to be there. So there is no this time why there are a, a be a pipe there or, or a block there. 
you just uh, show up something similar to that with the uh, training that data. So is it possible to create uh, the content that takes uh, some, uh, uh, for, uh, not only in the structural elements, but in the meaning of the object that you want to place in the levels? So first, uh, I'm gonna review the MDCMC approach that roughly speaking has three main parts. The first one is you take the level and you make an array of uh, elements. In this case, I have an example of Mario, where each tile you define as an empty or a ground or a pipe or a block. Then uh, you define a, a network structure that's gonna represent how the dependencies between the different tiles uh, you can want to generate. Here are some four examples. Uh, for example, the NS2, the, the tile depends on the tile on the left uh, and the tile on the bottom of the tile that you're going to sample. So once you define the, the network structure, you use all the <coughs> train data set to produce uh, the, the frequencies of, of these uh, tiles. And then you uh, start to sample a new level. To sample a new level, uh, you can start for some special tiles to so define the borders of the map. And you start from the bottom left of the map and keep building all the tiles from row to row until you get the level. From that, you will have a level that looks fine but maybe it's not playable at all. So you can uh, extend this with some constraint in the sampling. So the idea is to uh, chunk the level in different sections, and in every section, you check the constraints if they are valid or not. For instance, you can make a, a, an agent that plays the level, and if uh, in a specific section, section the agent gets stuck, so that it's not playable at this level, you remove this section and you resample again that section. So now the new contribution of this uh, paper is that, okay, we have the structural layer, but maybe we can add more layer to give some meaning to the things that we are placing in the map. <coughs> so they propose two different layers besides the structural layer. One is the height layer. The, so they range from one to five, the different altitudes of the tiles. So now the tiles, they have a knowledge of a place that there used to be. And the other layer is the player path. So you can define a path that you want to the player follow. So with this, you can add these uh, new layers to the network that we had spent before. And uh, it's like adding more information to the network. So in the blue is the, the single layer that we had before. And now we have the, the path layer and the head layer that depends on the tile that you want to sample in this uh, moment. So the idea now is when you want to sample the new map, you are gonna have beforehand the different layers. The hill layer is always the same, and the path layer you're gonna give it beforehand start sampling. So once you're gonna start sampling, the tile that you are gonna uh, produce depends on the left or the bottom, depends on the, the network you're using, and the layer of the path and the layer of the height. In this example, we see that the, the green tile that you want to produce depends on the left and bottom, that are empty uh, tiles, uh, nothing for the path tile, and a two for the altitude or the height of the map. They experimented with uh, generating maps for Super Mario, well, surprise here, uh, and they, the experiments, for the experiments, they sampled 1,000 levels using a single layer from the previous approach, and uh, another 1,000 levels using four different paths for the player and layer. Uh, two of them were extracted from one of the training maps, and the other two were handmade. Uh, yeah. So for the metrics to evaluate the, the maps that produced for this technique, they used the linearity, this is how well the level is approximate with a line, the leniency that estimates how difficult is the level, and then they added two more uh, metrics. So one is the Frechette distance that measures how similar are two paths. Uh, this is something like uh, you have to think uh, how long should be the row between two people following different paths. And the percentage of useful placing springs. So springs is an element that you can jump over and you uh, can jump higher than regular. So 
usually you can place these objects to, you need to jump over there to finish a level or not. So that's are some experiments in the results. The first one is a single layer that, okay, looks, looks okay. And then we have the four different paths. The two first ones, path one and path two, are extracted from the training data set. So they follow a path from uh, previously map, maps in the training set. And path three and path four are handmade from the, for the path. In the path three, they try to make a, a, a plateau area. So towards the end of the level, you can see that the player should be in the top of the, the level, not all, with, all the time in the, the bottom. And for the path four, they try to add a lot of jumps and really long jumps, and that they produce it, this kind of maps. So if we see the linearity and the leniency of the maps, uh, these are the heat maps where every pixel is a sample map. And if we compare the standard approach with a single layer, and the different uh, uh, four maps with different paths, the range of expressive that we can find are pretty much the same. So we are still keeping the extractive information of the map that we are able to generate with the first approach. Uh, and in this plot is the distance uh, between the different levels. So how, mm, how likely they are to see that they're similar. Here, the green dots are the train data set that hopefully you can see that spread it from all the plots. The red dots are with seeing only the single layer. And then the different blues are the different paths. You can see that the, the paths selected to make the, 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 the path one and path two are the ones that's pointed. And all the maps generated using these paths are really close to these ones. And then the other two paths are handmade. They are in their own different cluster, but still approaching to some maps that are available in the training set. So if we look at the matrix for the fresh head, uh, we see that the, the, the multi-layer with, uh, with the paths, they are really uh, close or it is small. That means that the path that uh, the final produced the map is closer to the one that we uh, first added to the layer. Uh, in the example here, we can see the, the blue as the, the path that was barely designed. The red was the path that an AI agent followed with using the <coughs> AI star technique. And the purple is where both agents uh, had the same path at that moment. So the difference is really small meaning that the intention to produce a jump in the middle of this chunk was achieved with putting some blocks or enemies there. Then the springs, here we can see the average number of springs per map and how the percent of where them were needed to complete the map. So in the training data set, 27% uh, of the springs that were, were there were needed to complete the map, but in the single layer, Besides, there are a lot of them, uh, like in the, the, the training data set, none of them particularly were needed to complete it. Why, while in the multi-layer, the, the springs were less common, but more needed to complete the level. Here we have two screenshots. The one uh, in the left is the, the one spring that is not needed to complete the level, and when the one in the right needs uh, to be used in order to complete the level. So the conclusion is with this approach, we are able to introduce some uh, knowledge to the, the, or propose to the levels that we want to produce. They want to follow, in this case, a path. Uh, and they, they can learn some uh, mechanism of the, of the game, like the, how to use the springs that are needed to complete the levels. And the future works, the, they want to try to use another domain like Load Runner. They have already experiments that they want to present in XAC. Uh, a way to automatically define other layers and add different layers like difficulty or enemy behavior or aesthetic information. So thanks for listening. And if you have any questions, I will try to do my best to answer them. But you have your uh, some email address here that he will be more than happy to answer any doubt. Questions?
Next presenter. Our next presenters will be uh, Yu Zhang and Ruck Pasanmas. Uh, they'll be presenting procedural generation of Angry Birds, fun levels using pattern struct and preset model. Okay. Hello, everyone. I am Yu Xian Jiang. Uh, Hi, Ruck Pasanmas. Our talk today is procedural generation of angry birds for levels uh, using pattern struct and the preset model. Okay, before we go into details of this presentation, I would like to mention our overview of uh, our long-term goal for the system. So the, the concept is like this. Um, from this picture, could you guess what we are trying to do? Okay, see, uh, so we have a module for detecting uh, prayer emotion, and right bottom, there is also a chatbot system which also considers not only player emotion, but also player ac activity data, playing lock, or even auto information. And from these two pieces of information, so the chatbot system will try to come up with uh, some, some words, okay, uh, that are deemed fit to the current situation of the player. And then those words will be fed to the generator, which will then uh, generate levels. Uh, in this case, angry birds reveled, uh, which are formed by suitable quotes or words, like this. So, for example, if the player is struggling, so so the system with oh, he's not doing well, he could not kill uh, pigs. So the system will try to show him level like this. Or when no, don't do that. I do that. I repeat this. Story. Okay, when okay, it's time to challenge the player, or maybe it will generate a little bit more challenging level and try to tease the player a little bit with that. Could, anyway, could you read uh, this level? Okay, cool. Or, um, for example, if the system detects that the player just arrived in New York, <laughs> no, that's fine. Okay, and then, or uh, even if it could detect some uh, important seasonal event, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so then, uh, my student he will be. Uh, giving you guys the detail of the system. Okay. Uh, in particular, sorry, the work we are presenting today is focused on only this part. Okay, uh, first the background. Uh, the, sorry. Our research is focused on reverse uh, a puzzle action a video game. In this game, the player uses a slingshot. Uh, hmm? Use it, uses a slingshot to launch a bird uh, to destroy as many pigs as possible. So the Angry Birds level generation competition has been held at CIG uh, since last year. Uh, there are 
uh, multiple tracks, but we focus on fun track and uh, uh, last year and the difficulty this year. So next, uh, overview and the purpose. Our funny code generator won the fun track last year. The, this generator can generate code levels and uh, uh, formula levels like this. Uh, the purpose of this research uh, I am presenting today is improve our generator uh, based on analysis results uh, of uh, clear retry and uh, recognition rates. Here are the communication rules uh, that rest restrict uh, block types and the number of peaks. Uh, next, I will be introducing some uh, related work. So examples of uh, generated levels from previous uh, work are shown here. Uh, however, all of them do didn't consider the fun factor uh, or were not able to generate uh, uh, character patterns. Next, the uh, mechanisms of funny codes. Uh, in this game, all objects are affected by gravity and uh, physics. So, uh, except an uh, object named uh, terrain. As a result, care must be uh, taken to gener generate a character. Uh, if not, it will be like this. So in order to implement a stable character, we improve it to approach, uh, appro approaches, the pattern struct and the preset model. Uh, in pattern struct, a number of uh, pattern struct files like this uh, prepared for each character to circumvent the rules on restructure of block types, uh, only one block type will be chosen from uh, usable ones randomly. Uh, then two materials will be uh, randomly chosen, one for forming the character uh, control and uh, the other one for making the character stable. So uh, finally, the terrain will be added under the character. In order to increase the diversity of character patterns, uh, preset model will be uh, was introduced. Uh, this model is used for some letters and the numbers uh, like this. So the procedure of generation of a character uh, is like this. This table show uh, our heuristics for setting the level uh, difficulty. The more number of peaks, the higher difficulty. Uh, on the right uh, is the levels, uh, th uh, there are levels with easy, normal, and hard difficulty respectively. Uh, there is uh, three uh, styles were provided uh, to enhance the diversity of uh, single-layered code levels, as shown like this. Uh, next, the pre experiments and the results. This, ex uh, this experiment was uh, conducted to examine the rec rec recognition of the words in a level and the clear rate and the retry rate. So. Participants' information uh, is shown here. Uh, each participant played in random order five levels per uh, each difficulty. So the number of peaks and the uh, words setting <coughs> like this. Uh, before playing, each participant was asked to input all words in the level, a uh, display in the level. For each level, two retries and uh, uh, two retries of inputting and playing were allowed. If they could not input the correct words or uh, clear the level at the last retry, 
uh, word recognition or level clear is considered failed. Uh, here are the results. Uh, first, the, uh, the the word recognition rate is 91.3%, which can be considered successful to prepare uh, work here. Uh, second, the clear uh, rate and uh, retry rate for each difficulty setting are shown here. Uh, this results indicate uh, that most of the created levels can be cleared in uh, with two retries. However, the difference among the three uh, difficulty setting is not clear. Um, this is the example of levels with field recognition are shown here. Uh, this B was uh, generated using its preset model. Uh, as a result, we plan to uh, improve the preset model. So these are the examples of uh, levels with failed rec uh, recognition due to the pattern struct. Uh, the later I, sorry, the later I was mistaken as the apostrophe in these uh, examples. So here are the here are the comments on funny code generator by CIG uh, 2016 reference. Uh, we focused on the challenging part and uh, uh, made our decision to also improve it. First, we used uh, this uh, equation to determine uh, which in, in initial peaks will be uh, removed. The, the peak removed probably distribution for each uh, difficulty setting is shown here. As shown in this uh, distribution, uh, the nearer peaks to the right side, uh, the higher probability will be removed. Uh, in particular for the, sorry, uh, for the easy setting, uh, because uh, further, uh, for further peaks are more difficult to shoot, so they are removed with a higher probability. Uh, here are our new heuristics for determine the number of birds according to the number of peaks. In most cases, uh, the number of birds is less than the number of peaks in order to increase the uh, challenging level. So here are the results from the second experiment. First, the clear, the clear and the retry rates uh, indicate that levels are more challenging after improvement. Uh, second, the difference among the uh, three difficulty setting are also clearer. And the third distance uh, is most uh, clear in APB. So in addition, uh, difference among the three difficult setting uh, in APB are statistically uh, significant. So however, there are some levels like this. It, can't, it could not be cleared by <laughs> participants. Uh, as a result, we plan to use AI to check it in advance, uh, other, whether or not generate levels can be uh, cleared. So uh, here are our conclusions and the uh, future works. So that was our attempt to improve uh, our previous generator last year. And this year, uh, this one of the generators that we submitted this year is called Funny Quartz featuring Domino's generator. So in addition to Quartz, we add uh, Domino's, okay? So that you can see that, okay, it has some domino effect. One's perfectly shot, okay? So we, in, in this generator, we exploit MCTS. 
uh, to determine place to determine location to place uh, objects, uh, characters or or dominoes, uh, with some uh, fitness function evaluation function consisting of terms like uh, the 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 number of block types in order to increase the diversity and the number of dominoes being placed or something like that. Okay, so this uh, as was announced yesterday, uh, it came second, okay? But uh, it's first for difficulty metric. By difficulty, it's not mean the, the, the most difficult, but it's mean the in terms of well balance in difficulty, okay? So, wow, we finished only five minutes earlier, okay, than expected. So we, before I allow you to ask us questions, I would like to invite some of you to, to play our uh, Angry Birds with our generators, starting with you, Che. Okay, you want, which one do you want to try, the winner last year or the runner up? No, no, no. Oh, okay. Okay. Featuring Dominic. Okay. So everyone has to watch. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you <it>. should. <laughs> I'll try it, and if, if I'm not a good tester, you can get someone else. Uh, oh, sorry, okay. maybe we should. Do I have to? How come that you cannot see? Yes. It's not Can I look at the screen? Yes. Oh, yeah, you can, I can just like, bring oh, it with oh, me? Okay, okay. Maybe this one. <laughs> okay. So what do I, what do I do first then? Yes. Oh, okay. What do I do? <laughs> uh, you have to use this um, chart and try um, to shoot like this. Okay, so just sling it back. Okay. Like, okay. Down. <laughs> down. Do I press on it? You know where the pigs are, and yes, the green ones are pigs. Okay. And I want to get them. Okay. Oops, you might want to get some. Oh. I, I, okay. Do I just press down and, yes. uh, and drag? And I'm dragging. Yes. I'm letting go. Press down, and drag, can you see that? Um, yes. Let go. Okay. Oh. I the one on the top. On the, on I know, the, you want me to get that guy, right? That okay, big guy. <laughs> okay. Pressing, see I'm pressing, but it doesn't. Nothing. Place it, but you know. So, see, look, uh, I'm pressing. Maybe like this. Sorry. No, I, Okay, it is just me. It's okay. not. I suck. Okay. <laughs> someone else? Okay. Someone else like to try it with someone else. But maybe someone that has played Angry Bird before would want to try it. Seems like it's fun. A challenge? <laughs> it's not touch. So it should be with a. Yes. <laughs> maybe we change another level. Yes. Okay. Maybe we, so maybe hmm? we change to another level. Another no, one. Now we start with this. Come on. Okay. 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 <laughs> you want to play this first? Okay. Go ahead. Come on. Give me another. Oh, nice. This is gonna be. Come on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
three more. This is the fence. This is a drop. Uh, yeah, but uh, no. <laughs> you can double double click here, right? It's a double click. It's, no, it's, no, 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 not uh, no, not double click. Right. Oh yeah, here you can do this. Um, no way. Let's try try further on. Too bad. So guys. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So I think it's time for questions. Um, okay, so I have a question that I wrote down earlier when you were talking about the um, word recognition, when it was, um, it couldn't recognize the apostrophe versus the I. I'm just wondering, I, I didn't catch why, or, or do you understand why that happened? Experiment one the, on, uh, about our experiment. It was create, trying to create the words. Um, I think it was weave with the apostrophe. Oh, or, yes, yes. And it put in the I instead. I'm just wondering um, why. Or, this one? This one? Yeah, so why? Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so some... Uh, so there is one participant who has mistaken uh, I don't know. So they are not making the, the, the thought is just high. They probably, yeah, when they input, they, they input as high. So it, it's hard to imagine if you are making the thought of this. Did this in Japan. Okay. But okay, probably it's also it's, it's very similar. You see, it, it looks like uh, the design. Okay, it, it looks like I. So it's also something wrong with the design of of this okay. character. It's a design problem. Other questions? Okay, well, I'd like to thank you again. Please, everyone, thank the speakers and, okay. and for letting us try their um, demo. That was very great. Coffee is ready. We are actually early, 20 minutes early. Uh, I think so. So should I announce that, or, or would you like to? Um, let's check. <laughs> Is it there? 
Okay. Yeah, I was going to check if we can start a little bit earlier. So, um, given that this session ended early, um, I would like to propose that we maybe start the next session maybe 15 minutes earlier, unless anyone objects. The next session, we also have one no-show in the next session, so we'll end the whole conference a little bit earlier. But I see that some of you are a little bit tired. So uh, I do not see very much objection. Those who would object are too tired to object. <laughs> right. We start the next session 15 minutes early, then.